runs at 20 volts, almost twice the shock level from a modern car battery. Look, look here, there is a signal of 20 volts, firing three times at intervals of only five milliseconds. This would cause a severe pain if inflicted upon a person. The ancient discoveries team now have a solid reading of the torpedo's electric potential. But the vital question remains, how did the Romans transform an aquatic taser weapon into an anesthetic? At the ancient discoveries pain lab, Dr. Watson is about to test how Plutarch's astonishing 2,000-year-old pain reliever actually relieves pain. And for that, we need someone in pain. David Shaw has returned to put his body on the line for another daredevil ancient experiment. We're going to measure how tolerant Dave is of pain. Dr. Watson places Dave's finger in a device called an algometer. This will push him to the limit of pain endurance by squeezing his finger until he can bear it no longer. I'm going to put your, your finger in here and I'm going to keep squeezing and I'm going to keep applying pressure until you tell me to stop. It's going to hurt, so give me a finger. I'm going to start applying the pressure and I'm going to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. As Dr. Watson cranks up the pressure on Dave's finger, neurotransmitters shoot up through the nervous system at 300 feet per second to deliver pain messages to the brain. At this rate, his brain is experiencing pain signals commensurate with a second degree burn. Go on, keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> and enough, a bit more. Oh, that'll do, that'll do, that'll do. Well, Dave, that was uh, 827. Well, 827 is not too bad. That's, that's certainly higher than average. And but then, uh, given your background and your exposure to pain in the past, then I'd, I'd expect you to be higher than average. Oh. Dave's reading reveals he is able to withstand 827 kilopascals of pressure, equivalent to having a 700-pound person standing on his finger. It's kind of an all-encompassing pain that, that you can't really escape from. Certainly wouldn't want to be in that kind of pain if it was a, a continual, uh, just a 24-7. You'd be looking for something, anything, um, to relieve the pain, especially if it was as intense as I've just experienced. Now, the way we think the torpedo worked is that it produced enough electrical charge to theoretically numb pain by neutralizing the nerve impulses sending messages to the brain. So Dr. Watson matches the number of volts produced by the torpedo and administers that to our patient. We're going to be using an electrical stimulator that delivers a particular kind of current. It's really just a modern version of what the Romans were doing with their torpedo fish. OK, Dave, so what we've done is we put a couple of fairly big electrodes here. I'm just going to turn this up really slowly. The electrical current is almost identical to the 20-volt reading from the torpedo. If the ancient accounts are correct, in his electrically numbed state, Dave should now be able to increase his pain score of 827 kilopascals. How it works is this. There's a gate in the spinal cord which controls how much pain does and doesn't get through. We are simply using electricity to make the nerve fire. The stimulation of this nerve is going to shut the pain gate and effectively we're going to reduce the ability of the body to transmit pain from the hand up to his brain and if the pain starts in his hand but doesn't reach his brain he can't feel it and therefore he will feel less pain. Now Dr. Watson must test whether the electrotherapy theory works in practice. After 15 minutes of electrical stimulation at 20 volts Dr. Watson cranks up the pinometer for the second time. The penometer crunches Dave's finger into one quarter of an inch. He is now experiencing a far greater level of pain than we would expect a human to be able to take. Yep. <sighs> okay. So that gives us 1096. So that's 1096. That's different from last time. Very it's different. 200 up. 200 up. That's about 25% about up on where we were before. Originally, he was feeling 827, and that's when he told me to stop. This time, we got up to 1096, 1096 before he told me to stop. So I've made him less able to feel pain. 
Dave can now withstand pressure equivalent to being run over by a two-ton truck. 2,000 years after Plutarch's first accounts, this pioneering experiment has revealed that the stories of the ancient Romans' miracle cure are grounded in fact. I'm pretty sure they didn't understand about pain gates in the spinal cord, and I'm pretty sure they didn't understand about stimulating nerves in order to get pain relief, but they knew that using electricity, which happened to come from a torpedo fish, produced the sensation of pain relief. Thousands of years later, our modern machines are just, a, a, just an up-to-date way of doing torpedo fish therapy. Even the Romans might wince at some of the treatments in the mysterious world of the Incas. Here, doctors literally cut open the human head. In Cusco, Peru, in the remote reaches of the Andes, a cache of over 500 Incan skulls has been discovered. Over half bear signs of terrible, seemingly impossible injuries. Circular wounds in the skull up to three inches across too precise to be inflicted by any known weapon. Evidence of an ancient, gruesome practice. Inca historian Peter Frost is investigating the mythical world of the Incas. The mystery of the Incas comes from the fact that they were a civilization that grew up uh, in isolation from the rest of the world. There wasn't any contact with them, uh, and they didn't have a written language. The skulls were found in a region known as the Sacred Valley, home to the magnificent lost city of Machu Picchu. Founded in the year 1450, the city lies at almost 8,000 feet above sea level. Surrounded by cliffs and continually wreathed in cloud, this was the secretive citadel of a civilization that ruled over one million square miles and 10 million people. Yet the Incas lived here for just 100 years, sucking the mystery of the Incan skulls into the mists of time. Five centuries later, new forensic evidence may yet solve the riddle. It suggests that the people survived their injuries. There are lots of examples of skulls that they've uh, unearthed which show that the skulls began to grow back over the wound. The linchpins of Incan warfare were weapons such as the club or mace, weapons that deliver severe trauma injuries, such as a fracture to the skull. The thing uh, about a, a skull injury or a skull fracture, a depression fracture, is that it pushes bone fragments into the brain area and they must be elevated or taken away because, of course, the skull is a box. And uh, if the box is closed and there's bleeding inside the brain, then pressure increases and eventually the brain uh, must die. Incan surgeons developed an astonishing solution to this seemingly fatal injury. They did develop one technique which is extraordinarily sophisticated, which is skull trepanation. Trepanation is the uh, removal of uh, an area of the skull to uh, release pressure or to decompress uh, a depressed fracture of the skull. We can tell how long an Inca lived after the procedure by analyzing the skulls to see if they show signs of healing. Amazingly, in 80% of the observed cases, the Incas survived this early form of brain surgery. But how? At the Ancient Discoveries Laboratory, leading surgeon Mike Edwards is taking a journey back through 600 years of history. He is carrying out a trephination using Incan tools on the head of a dead sheep, purchased from a butcher shop. The challenges involved in performing a trepanning in Incan times must have been uh, tremendous. Let's imagine that I'm sitting on some Peruvian hillside with this chap's head between my knees. And I've taken the hair away by shaving, and I'm just making my first incision. Mike will use the same blade as the Incan surgeons, a form of volcanic glass called obsidian, which is five times sharper than surgical steel. Keep in mind, the Inca patient would not have been anesthetized. It's a tense time because I know it's gonna hurt the guy that I'm operating on, 
but yet I have to keep my nerve. I mustn't be put off by his screams and my hand mustn't shake and I've got to know what I'm doing is going to benefit him. It's the same for any surgical procedure apart from the fact in this case my patient's wide awake and feeling what I'm doing. The obsidian blade went through the scalp in one fluid move so it's an incredibly sharp instrument. It takes Mike about 30 minutes to cut through the bone. Not long unless you're an Inca patient. During the operation, Mike lacerates several cranial nerves, sending extreme pain messages instantaneously to the brain. Beneath the bone lies the dura, a thin layer embedded with blood vessels. It is the body's final layer protecting the brain, but it has the consistency of a cotton shirt. I'm very careful as I go through the skull not to damage the dura because I know if I pierce the dura it's going to bleed and I may not be able to control the bleeding I will also enter the brain tissue it may be that there's pressure inside the brain that has caused me to be doing this procedure in the first place so if I pierce the dura there's every chance that the brain may just burst through like toothpaste and just come out in front of me and the patient will die within seconds well, looking at this, I think this has been a successful trepanning. We've made the skin flap that you see here. We've gone through the periosteum. We've gone through the bone. And this, peeping up at us through this hole here, is the dura. The vast majority of patients were killed not by the trepanning, but by infection of the brain afterwards. But eight out of 10 Incan patients survived. The bone reformed over the hole and the skin healed, leaving nothing behind but a small indentation. In the same time period, over 6,000 miles away in England, a simple blacksmith set about transforming medical history. How did he use nothing more than a hammer and molten metal to perform brain surgery needed to remove an arrow that had been shot straight through the head of the most powerful prince in the medieval world. The ultimate test center for medicine is the theater of war. Yet few today realize that the surgical techniques deployed in war zones from Vietnam to Iraq were invented over two millennia ago in Imperial Rome. The Roman drive for military might saw the creation of the Medici, the first medical army elite in history. The medics became very much more important and significant as the Roman army became professionalized. Um, and this was around the, the first century AD by Emperor Augustus, who recognized the importance of having a quality medical support team for his forces, for his armies. Preserved at the Museum of Roman Civilization in Rome lies an intriguing collection of images taken from Trajan's column and dating from the year 113 AD. They depict surgeons operating on the front lines, applying bandages, splints, and emergency first aid. If the reliefs are accurate, they show that the Roman surgeons pioneered the tools and techniques used by today's military medics. Leading surgeon Damien Mole is investigating. The basic principles behind surgery and surgical operations have changed little throughout the ages, even though the technology has. A battlefield surgeon would be interested in stopping blood or needing to perform an emergency amputation. He would have needed something to cut skin, muscle, tendon, which would be a knife, and he would have needed something to cut bone, which would have been a saw. This saw is still used by many, many operators to cut through bone during an amputation. An extraordinary account left in a second century text by a Roman surgeon named Celsus describes an early use of scalpels, hooks, and clamps. Amazingly, its instructions are still obeyed in operating theaters today. Modern surgeons clean and stitch up wounds just as he recommended over 1800 years before. Only a foolish surgeon would ever ignore history and ignore the past. The kind of clamps and, and, and that we used in Roman times are similar to the 